Thank you for tuning in to the Simple Sophisticate Podcast, the show that is part of the Simply Luxurious Life online destination, cultivating true contentment, the art of living a life of quality over quantity. Visit the blog, The Simply Luxurious Life, at our simplified URL, tsll.co, or thesimplyluxuriouslife.com to find the show notes for each podcast episode, as well as much more weekly content to elevate your everyday and deepen your contentment. From a Monday motivational post, recipes, videos of the cooking show series, style and decor inspiration, French and British inspired content, and reader's favorite regular weekly post, This and That, which is posted each Friday morning. Now to today's episode. Welcome to the Simple Sophisticate Podcast, where intelligent living is paired with signature style. I'm your host, Shannon Abels. And whether you're listening on your commute, exercising, working in the garden, or sitting down with a hot cup of tea or a cafe au lait, thank you for tuning in. Let's get started. Welcome to the 341st episode of The Simple Sophisticate. And welcome to fall. Since the last time we met towards the end of September, we were just concluding the summer season or the fall season for my listeners in the Southern Hemisphere. And now we find ourselves in a new season. And for me, it feels when we transition into autumn as though it's a cozying in time. And so today's episode just seemed to be a good fit for this time of year. What we're going to talk about today are the aesthetics, the interior aesthetics of an English cottage. And specifically, I'm going to share the first 15 key elements I included in my English cottage inspired home. And when you visit the show notes, you're going to see that the title also includes the phrase part un, so part one, because this is just the beginning of what will be a lengthy exploration, a fun exploration of how to create the cottage that you deeply love that is inspired by the traditional English cottage aesthetic. We'll be looking at the interiors, the exteriors, and of course the gardens. And before I get to more detail about that, we have a petit plaisir that is a dinner recipe I picked it out of a new cookbook to me from a highly respected British nutritionist and chef. I think she calls herself a cook, but she should call herself a chef. But (laughs) she uh, offers this recipe that I made a couple weeks ago. And as soon as I sat down and and dined, I said, I want to share this with the listeners of the Simple Sophisticate. I think they're going to love it. It is simple. It is delicious. And it's healthy. And we have full and busy lives, so I thought it'd be perfect. But let's dive into the main topic of our episode today. The 15 key elements I included in my English cottage-inspired home. I want to begin with a quote from writer Mamet Marat Ildan. He wrote, In a simple and a peaceful cottage with a beautiful view, you will not be dreaming about the palaces or the heaven, because you already have a perfect thing. I love that quote because at the core of it, it's about being at peace in the everyday, savoring the everyday moments and just enjoying the beauty of what is. And we make it so, and it's a mindset, but we can make it even so more deeply so by our attention to the little details and significant details that make a cottage a sanctuary. To feel welcomed, to feel deeply at home in a sanctuary, to feel cozied in, as they like to say, almost as though to be hugged without confinement and instead inspire infinite curiosity to explore and play. To me, all of these feels are what comes to mind when I think of the classic English cottage, both inside and out. 
As I mentioned just a second ago, over the next many months and years, I look forward to exploring and sharing elements of the English cottage aesthetic, the interiors, exteriors, and the garden of a cottage. Because as many of you know, my home, Le Papillon, is what I consider to be a cottage. Perhaps it began with watching Nancy Myers' film The Holiday and the cottage I later learned she had built especially for the movie Rose Hill Cottage. Or maybe it was the interiors of the many homes profiled in the English Home magazine that I have subscribed to for over 10 years and continue to eagerly await the arrival of each new issue. Whatever precisely drew me to the English cottage aesthetic, I cannot pinpoint, but I always take notice of how I feel in a space, whether I am traveling and staying at vacation rentals, bed and breakfast, hotels, or even when I'm staying at friends and family's homes. Unconsciously and also consciously, I'll ask myself, what makes me feel most at ease? What details attended to What details attend to my needs to bring me comfort? Where can I truly relax and feel at home when I am not at home? And mentally, over the years, I just took note. And finally, with my house here in Bend, Oregon, Le Papillon, I have been able to customize, paying attention to all of the details, grand and small, that to me, whilst adhering to the fundamental components of English Cottage, create a sanctuary I feel at home deeply at home when I am here. There are oodles of interior decor components that contribute to creating the English cottage aesthetic. So I want to begin with where I began and what is in my own home, Le Papillon. Today I will be sharing pictures and images that offer the vignette or a close-up look at the details discussed here in today's episode. And for each image, you will be able to click through to take the tour of that particular entire space. Um, And I detail in all the room tours I do in my house, I detail before, after, and a very specific objective list. Like what was my goal before I dove in? Because each of these projects, and I have had, what now, one, between six and seven specific room projects completed in the last two and a half years, I want to share with you the process that I go through in my mind and where the decisions come from, why they don't, none of them are just random. And um, because I do plan on having this home for the rest of my life, this is my forever home. And so I want to share what I've learned and um, the oopses I made and what I would do differently and, and, and just help out in any way I can, because I, I, that's how I learned too. I, observed or read how people would proceed through their own customizations. And if you want to click through, so back to that point, so you're going to see vignette pictures. You're not going to see the whole rooms. Um, But if you want to see the whole room tour that I was just mentioning, um, explore becoming a top tier member because you will gain exclusive access to all of the home tours at my house. Um, And that is exclusive to top tier members. That is only open to those members in the community. And as I share in the title of today's episode, this is part one, and I look forward um, to sharing many more elements that are in my home in future episodes and postings on the blog. But first to begin with the history of the English cottage and cottage garden, as Christopher Lloyd and Richard Bird share in their book that came out in 1999 about cottage gardens, They wrote, it has come down to us through the ages to be a bountiful yet regulated informality, end quote. And while they are specifically talking about the cottage gardening approach, the same can be said for the interiors as well. And they speak about what cottages were um, in England's time historically. And I know many of you who tune in are from Britain, specifically England. And if you have specific knowledge of this aesthetic, please do share. It's something that I am still a student in. That's why I'm journeying through this and I'm excited to share what I learn. Um, It's also why I look forward to hopefully traveling back to England many, many more times. (laughs) What I like about that description, so it's bountiful yet regulated informality. Everything that is chosen is thoughtful. It is intentional, but it may not appear to be so to the untrained eye. And they go on to say, quote, the cottage and cottage garden have evolved through common sense and it combines the need with enjoyment and is entirely unpretentious. So it's involving functionality, enjoyment, and is unpretentious. With that definition in mind, let's take a look at the first 15 key elements I included in my English cottage inspired home, Le Papillon. Number one. Ignore all trends of the moment 
at any moment. I want to begin with a quote from British interior designer Fiona Mackenzie Johnston. She writes, Ultimately, good taste is a considered point of view and the courage of conviction, even in the face of dissent. End quote. Before we dive into the entirety of today's episode, it is important to differentiate between classic English cottage and cottage core, this phrase that's been going around for a couple years now. And the latter, cottage core, became a booming decor trend during the depths of the pandemic, but they are not the same. And the latter, cottage core, is the trend. Similar to the most recent trend that began on social media, the coastal grandmother style, which is both decor and fashion, it is also a trend. However, if something offered by either one of these trends, cottage core or the coastal grandmother, speaks to you, hold on to that. Explore that element and that becomes part of your good taste suggested above in the quote. The problem with adhering to a trend is that by definition, it will go out of style and a new trend will replace it. The primary and perhaps more unconscious reason both of these trends rose to popularity when they did has a lot to do with the times we found ourselves. We were seeking comfort. We were seeking something that brought us calm and certainty during some of the most uncertain and unprecedented times we have ever seen across many generations and around the world. This is not a bad thing. Again, if an aspect of a trend speaks to you, there is a reason, and that is how we hone our understanding of what will work for a long duration of time in our homes as we decorate for the life we love living. And secondly, regarding the problem with trends, is that you are not decorating, if you follow that trend, in an approach that honors you, but rather following what others approve of. And in such an approach to life in any arena, whether it's decor, fashion, life choices, this is never an approach that will lead to true lasting contentment. So we let go of trends and dare to trust that what we know makes us feel good, feel at home, even if magazines or social media says, huh, when we post about it or talk about it, and what we also do by adhering to our own taste. And this is key is understand how good design works. So you don't want to just start, I mean, I have made these mistakes and I've written about them. <laughs> I think I wrote most of most of these mistakes about the ones that I made in my first book, um, Choosing the Simply Luxurious Life. I mean, I painted an entire living room red. People, this is a stressful color. I toned it down. I made it, I made it welcoming, but it was still red. Three coats later and it was really red. I learned from that. I learned from that. I learned the power of color and which rooms certain colors work well in based on the energy you want to create. And so you want to, yes, you want to follow your own true, you know, compass, your good taste, but that good taste is strengthened and refined when you apply how good design works. And the reason I mentioned the need to not just acknowledge what speaks to you about a trend. So say something in cottage core really spoke to you or the grandmother style really spoke to you. Maybe not the whole thing. And that's that's the key part. I don't think every single thing is what one person will want to mimic. I think it's a comfort to know that you're going to be approved of by other people. But if you're really being honest with yourself, what is it? What are the details, the components that really just caught your eye? And you said, oh, that, oh, that would make me feel so at home. The key here is not just to acknowledge them, but to explore it. Because we must understand the decor principle that makes such a decor detail work in that particular way. We'll talk about this more in the next point, but I have always been drawn to the expertise of mixing and matching of prints that the English seem to know how to do intuitively, except I know it is a learned skill. And so I took an online course a couple years ago, and I discovered exactly what works and why, along with many other insider tips and tricks. And I'll link to that particular course um, on the show notes. Before I invested in anything for this house, I did my homework. Well, why does this work? And how can I make what I want, the feeling that I want, how can I, what, what do I need to create that? Because I wanted to invest in items that would be with me a very long time, especially the key items. And we'll talk about some of those in today's conversation. So that's number one, ignore all trends of the moment at any moment. Number two, wallpaper, prints large and or small. 
The power of wallpaper with prints is that it is an illusion to the eye and actually makes the space feel larger than it is. Unlike with solids, either regarding wallpaper or your typical paint job, a solid wall of any color stops the eye. You can't see through it. It's a solid wall of color. We will talk about this more with upholstery as well later on in our conversation today, but prints, while beautiful and aesthetic, also serve the powerful and necessary purpose in what typically are small in square footage or yards that cottages are. Yeah, typically cottages are small homes. Um, They weren't grand estates. They weren't, you know, large country houses. These were small spaces. So you wanted to make them feel larger, especially because a lot of them have very low ceilings. So you want to be cognizant of how you feel in a room. And if you feel claustrophobic, if you feel confined, that's not comforting. So that's what the power of a print does. It it enlarges the space. It fools the eye in a very good way. Longtime readers and listeners will know that I have wallpapered multiple rooms in Le Papillon, six rooms as of this episode. And I have done so all by myself in this particular house. I didn't begin doing this task on my own, however, but I'm grateful I had a good teacher. So yes, you can wallpaper on your own. And the key thing really is to purchase quality wallpaper. You will have to invest, but that makes the process so much simpler. It's not going to tear on you. It's going to do what you want. And you can wrestle with it quite aggressively, actually, and still not worry about it ripping or tearing. Um... Really, you're halfway there to creating a great space when you purchase quality paper. But I did write a detailed post sharing how you can wallpaper all by yourself. You absolutely literally can. And I've included the link to that post on today's show notes. With that said, sometimes the wallpaper will be the guiding detail that determines all other decisions in the room, such as my guest bathroom. And I include a picture, one picture of that guest bathroom on the show notes. It was my dogged determination to find a space in my house to bring the classic Willow Bow print by William Morris, one of his first creations in 1870. And so when I decided it would be in my guest bathroom, all of the other details for that room had to complement the wallpaper because it was bathed completely, all four walls in this lovely green and brown and soft taupe um, wallpaper. It was the star of the show and everything else was going to support it. It was a supporting cast. However, wallpaper can also simply complement so it can be the reverse. And that is what I have done in my foyer um, by using grass cloth as it provides a warmth due to its texture, but it is not the star of the show. As well, small versus large prints. The large prints, as you might imagine, lead the way, but the small prints complement what the other stars in the room are. Choose the same color tone as those star pieces, but they need not be the same color, although they can and likely should play off of at least one color in the wallpaper. So for example, my next project when it comes to curtains is to add Roman shades to my kitchen. I have two windows and a glass door in my kitchen and they're south facing. So I do want to be able to um, draw the shades and also in the winter to keep the cold out, even though I have very nice windows. But it's amazing how even in the summer when those windows are um, exposed, so no curtains are pulled, the room does heat up. Anyway, so um, I was talking with my friend, Veronique, who helped me with all of my curtains in my house. And we were paying attention um, because my house is an open floor plan for the main living spaces. I needed to pay attention to both the boot and basket room, also called the mud room, as well as the dining room, because my kitchen is situated in between both of those rooms. And so Veronique saw that there was green in my boot and basket room wallpaper and she noted the color tone um, with regards to my blue provincial blue curtains in my dining room and told me that green would probably be the best color to find in a print for my Roman shades and this just helped narrow down the options because as you know there are so many prints out there for fabric let alone for wallpaper and uh, But it was the wallpaper in the mudroom, the boot basket room, that guided that decision. And I haven't made that decision yet, but at least I know what I'm kind of looking for. And that's the key. I think sometimes these decisions of wallpaper and fabric become overwhelming because there are so many choices. And so we just say, oh, I'm just going to paint the walls white, or I'm just going to paint them beige. I've done that. I mean, I've done that. 
And it's fine. It doesn't not work. It just doesn't sing. It doesn't, ah, uh, there's a, there's a risk involved, but if you do your homework, you're going to be happy with the results. So um, on this item number two, which I just talked about, wallpaper, prints large and or small, I've included a list of 12 British wallpaper companies to know. Um, be sure to check that out. I wrote that a couple years ago and I just updated it this summer. And so you can take a peek at all 12 of these wallpaper, in comp wallpaper companies um, and many of them I have used. I also provide a link to the guest bathroom if you like to take a tour and the link to how to wallpaper all by yourself. Number three is mixing antiques, vintage consignment finds with new, but thoughtfully considered new pieces. This detail of cottage decorating is probably one of my favorites, and it's perhaps yours as well. We're talking about treasure hunting, of course, and yes, we need to underscore that clutter is never a comfort. So always letting yourself purchase what is drawing your eye at that that recent estate sale or, or consignment shop is not a great idea unless it serves a purpose and has a home in your cottage along with being something that caught your eye. Cottages by definition are small and just like the cottage garden, each item does two things. It provide beauty and functionality. And part of the reason it takes time to decorate a cottage is because just because something is beautiful doesn't mean it is functional. And just because something is functional doesn't guarantee that it is attractive to your eye. For example, all of the technology and gadgets available for modern living. Think of it as a treasure hunt, as we just mentioned. And then this searching that does take time becomes more pleasurable. Because when you finally do come across, say, a newspaper rack holder that is desperately needed to keep the papers from being strewn across the floor on Sunday morning while you cozy into your reading nook, you will also be welcoming in something that is pleasing to the eye, but exercising a function that you need for a tidy home. Overarchingly, this is why it is necessary to mix old and new items. Yes, you will likely have more old in the form of vintage, antique, or consignment, but there are just some things that have to be new. Certain chairs or furniture to fit the size or height of the people in the home. For me, for example, I needed a long sofa and I needed a deep one. So I customized one as it is the star of the room. And this investment was worth it for years, decades even, of cottage style I love, but also comfort I needed. And you can see this sofa in uh, many of my A Cup of Moments video chats if you want to take a peek. I'll talk more about that later in our conversation. So that's number three. Mix antiques, vintage, and consignment finds with new but thoughtfully considered pieces. Number four. Remove the overhead lighting. I think I've talked about this a few, more than a few, <laughs> a few times. So... Um, no doubt some of you know why I don't like this, but um, this rule is not exclusive to cottages, but rather how to create a welcoming home. Nobody looks their best under lighting from above, unless maybe you are young and perfect and blissfully ignorant to the benefits of youth. But even then, you're not looking your best with overhead lighting. Overhead lighting also creates, creates a harsh effect that is not warm nor soft on the eye. Yes, admittedly, there will be places in the home or in your working areas, depending upon what work you will be doing, where overhead lighting is necessary. But even then, customize it so that you can dim it to your preferred brightness. The only two places I have overhead lighting that go full tilt bright are in the kitchen and the garage. And in my kitchen, my overhead lighting is on a dimmer. In fact, all of the new light fixtures I have put in my home during my two-year renovation customization are on dimmers. And this is advice from British interior designer Rita Koenig. And she states right out of the gates, always put lights with dimmers when installing the, the electrical outlets. So if you're running new electrical outlets or you're updating the electrical outlets, put in a dimmer option. That way you can create the ambiance you want. Even if your home has overhead or ceiling or can lighting, do what I do and don't use them. And better yet, take the light bulbs out so they are never used by mistake. There, there's something about coming home, maybe someone's house sitting for you, for example, and you're exhausted, you've been traveling, you're, you're jet lagged, and your house sitter, this happened to me once and she was very young and very sweet and I adore her and she takes such good care of my dogs and she always makes me feel at peace when I'm traveling. 
But the first time she stayed in my house, when I came home, so many overhead lights were on. It was like 10 o'clock at night and it was just not welcoming. And of course, it's such a nitpicky thing. But again, your jet lag, so everything kind of just affects you. And then I have to say this because she is the most sweet young woman. Um, she's not a young woman anymore. She's grown up. But uh, I came home this past April when she house sit and dog sit for, for me. And it was, again, 10 o'clock at night. And um, she had just turned the table lamps on in the living room, just a few. She lit the fire, the gas fireplace, because it was April and we had just been having snow. And I can't tell you how warm and welcomed I felt after a very busy travel day. Um, I, 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 let, I shared with her how, how that was just the most priceless moment. And so it's, it's those kind of details. You don't always know why you feel the way you feel when you walk in a room, but a lot of the times it has to do with lighting. So keep that in mind. And maybe you're not as sensitive to it as I am. And so I just want to acknowledge that. Um, I just pay attention to all those little details. It's just how I've always been. And I just acknowledge how I feel in a room and I want to feel my best in my own home because that's what I have control over. This might sound extreme, but you want to feel comfortable in your house. So add the lamps, and we'll talk about this in a later point in our conversation today, that create the lighting you want that is in your control. This is possible with table lamps, floor lamps, picture lights, and semi-flush pendant or chandelier lighting. So that's number four. Remove or just simply don't use the overhead lighting. Number five is relinquish the idea of perfection and avoid matchy matchy. The beautiful puzzle of the English cottage is that when it comes together, delights me to no end. And it is the ability to match seemingly different prints and colors in a manner that fits together perfectly as though they were meant to go together. How do they do that? (laughs) I'm saying to myself. First, let's talk about avoiding the matchy matchy. It is completely understandable why people, and I count myself among them, do this. It's safe and it doesn't break, so to speak, I put that in air quotes, any rules or is it's not too harsh on the eye. However, if you are decorating your cottage, you have broken the rule because a cottage is meant to look almost accidentally put together when really it was quite intentional. But there is a playful element always in a cottage, a daring element that reveals a bit about the inhabitants and what you love and what makes you smile and where you've been, your favorite colors, etc. Avoiding the matchy-matchy doesn't mean you don't do it everywhere. But when it's what you rely on in every room, it doesn't reveal you. For example, I have two pairs of matching lamps in my house. One pair is in my living room and one is in my primary bedroom. For me, they create balance, a solid, subtle foundation because they are placed, and this is especially true in my living room, they are placed in a space that has a lot of different prints, a lot of different details and non-matching furniture. So they provide the base of expectation for the eye because the rest is not what they're expecting. So essentially, use matchy-matchy not to play it safe, but when it actually provides a value for the decor aesthetic you are trying to create in a cottage. Which brings me to letting go of perfection. A cottage never looks partnered off or symmetrical, but it feels oddly still balanced. How do you do this has always been my question. It is easier to learn this skill by looking at whole room pics, so I highly recommend picking up copies of the English Home magazine. But you might have two armchairs, say for example, in my in my case, in my reading nook, but they don't match, and they have entirely different prints. In my case, one is a stripe and the other is a floral print. One is made of, of silk and the other one is made of not silk. Let's just say that. There's a lot of different fabrics in that one. But they don't match. So to the casual eye, this pairing appears imperfect and off balance, but it's in balance actually because they have the same color tone and that tone is married in the curtains that stand between them. I still have two chairs, but they don't visually look the same, but have the same weight to the eye. And that's where the decor or the design knowledge and understanding of why something works is going to help you make decisions that initially may not look right to a new onlooker, but you know why they work. And because you live in that space, you need them to work. So this idea of perfection is what you want to let go. But what you create, 
that establishes the balance will be perfect to you. And here's a quote from a well-respected American interior designer, Billy Baldwin. He shared, be faithful to your own taste because nothing you really like is ever out of style. That's number five, relinquish the idea of perfection and avoid matchy matchy. Number six, a cottage beckons you to sit down and relax. How do we create an aesthetic that speaks this language? Well, Ottomans play a powerful role in the symphony of details in a cottage. I once had two friends come to dinner. They are a couple. And when they walked through the foyer, this is the first time they've been to my new house, and into the open plan, after I asked them to pick any seat they'd like to sit in, one of them said, I cannot choose. They all look so comfortable. Each one is asking me to sit down and relax. And that is what I hoped I could create for myself, but also for my guests. That was the goal. Even if the English cottage style isn't their preference, there is a feeling I want to create for everyone who walks through the door. And that is the feeling when it comes to choosing my furniture. Ottomans by nature ask you to put your feet up on them, to essentially stop doing and just be. There are so many different styles of Ottomans and sizes, so have some fun finding the right ones. And I do say plural here because you're going to want more than just one ottoman. As I look around me, as I'm writing this in my house, this episode, I can count four ottomans or hassocks, which are a bit smaller and lower to the ground, that are in my house. Some are hand-me-down, some are consignment, and one is brand new and customized. They all perform a function, but their fabric or finish also work in the space aesthetically. One matches the chair it is paired with, but it is also a hassock, so my pups use it as a stepping stool of sorts to climb up into the chair. This is Norman's favorite chair, and he he uses that hassock to get up there. I will admit an error on my part um, to one choice of, of fabric for my new um, ottoman. I love having this ottoman. It's tuft, and it matches my um, reading chair, my Poirot reading chair. And I did match the fabric. But if I move forward and change any fabric in my living room, it will be for this ottoman because it is a bit too matchy-matchy and too much of one fabric in that corner of the room. But this is how we learn. And if we purchase quality pieces of furniture, then down the road, when we want to change it up, all we have to do is reupholster, not purchase an entirely new piece. And that's where it gets expensive. So it's cost per wear in many ways, same as our clothing. You're going to purchase something that's made well. And then all you have to do is care for it. And the bones, the bones are what you're investing in. Um, Yes, fabric can be very expensive too. But um, when you only have to pay for one of them, it definitely um, saves a lot of, of money. And it's a sustainable approach to decorating. So that's number six. Ottomans, just simply put, Ottomans, (laughs) Ottomans, <laughs> welcome them into your house. Number seven is to reupholster furniture you love. Speaking of reupholstering, since we just talked about that in number six, one of the best arguments for purchasing high quality furniture is because of what we just talked about in the conclusion for number six. Likely your tastes will evolve a bit and some of us a lot, but when you have a favorite well-made piece of furniture, you can have it for life. The upholstery may change, But having an ideal cottage chair or sofa or dining room chair is near priceless for an item that you will have to pay well for. I have reupholstered a chair I inherited from my late great aunt and uncle's home. And it's in my office. Um, It's a chair that was made in the 50s. It's not a super fancy chair, but it's a nice chair. And it was well taken care of by my aunt and uncle. So in very good condition structurally. The fabric, however, had to go. And it needed to be refurbished. So the cushion had to be replaced. But I love, I I love the fabric that we chose. We chose a herringbone green fabric. And it just, the chair now, you know, I look at it and I still know that that's my aunt and uncle's chair. And so it just holds a lot of memories for me and it makes me smile. I have also purchased consignment furniture throughout my house that I love structurally, but the fabric where I found it wasn't, it wasn't right. And often this is why these pieces don't sell. Uh, You, someone sees the fabric and they're like, that won't work in my house. But the thing is, if the structure of the piece of furniture works, you're going to save money buying it. And then you can use that savings to purchase the fabric that you want and have it reupholstered. Um, These are two chairs, the one that I just spoke about, my great aunt and uncle's and the 
large office chair that you can see in September's A Cup of Moments um, that I reupholstered. So that's number seven, reupholster furniture you love. Number eight, have fun selecting or customizing your pillows and put them nearly everywhere. I once heard a man, um, he happened to be American, um, about my age, maybe a little bit older, so maybe late 40s. But I th- And I think it's important to point that out. Um, he said he never wanted pillows anywhere in his house. And the reason we were talking about this is because he had recently finished entirely remodeling his house. Um, indirectly, he was insinuating that to have pillows, throw pillows, were feminine. And he didn't want to appear weak. Long story short, uh, needless to say, I didn't say but wanted to say, (laughs) you are missing the purpose of pillows, dude. Uh, Admittedly, when pillows are used just to look good, then yes, by all means, get rid of them. They can clutter. They're they're absolutely unnecessary. I completely agree on that. But there is a purpose to having pillows. And the cottage, um, cottage, an English cottage aesthetic has really mastered this. And so have English interiors, period. I think if you look at country houses, especially. If they are well made and in the right shape for the piece of furniture they are placed in, they have function and they have beauty. And again, back to the core reasons you purchase or welcome something into your cottage. They have to fit those two things. For example, on my George Sherlock sofa, which is incredibly deep, you cannot sit upright without having a large 22-inch square pillow at least behind you. And it must be a somewhat firm, well-made pillow. So over the past summer, after more than a year of figuring out which fabric would work best in the space without being matchy-matchy in my living room, I had six 22-inch square pillows made with five different fabrics. So only two have the same fabric and the rest are all different and they're not placed in any particular order. They serve a purpose, the ability to sit comfortably on the sofa, but you can also rearrange them if you want to lay down. And they are all covered in fabrics that work with the sofa and the space of the living room and then also throughout the rest of the house because it's an open space. You can tour my primary bedroom and um, speaking of different sizes of pillows and learn about the three different sizes I used and chose and why I chose them. And I'll provide a link to a tour of the primary bedroom if you want to take a look at that. But before we get to number nine, I have a few sponsors I'd like to introduce you to and I'll meet you on the other side. For a long time, I have searched products that bait and enhance the health of my hair. Thanks to Vegamore. Not only am I finally seeing results, but I am finally getting the hair I have always wanted. Vegamore has transformed the quality of my hair. It is their holistic approach to hair health that uses smart botanicals that promote visibly thicker, fuller, longer looking hair. And with help from Vegamore, you too can get healthier, beautiful looking hair without the use of harmful chemicals. All their products are cruelty free and never contain parabens or hormones. Having Vegamore as a go-to shampoo and conditioner is a game changer for overall hair health. And having used their Grow Revitalizing Shampoo and Conditioner Kit, I did see shinier, thicker, healthier, thus stronger hair. And for someone who has fine hair, but a lot of it, it did make a tremendously positive difference. With Vegamore, there is no risk when trying because they have a 90-day money-back guarantee. But with 91% of customers saying they saw visibly thicker hair with Vegamore in just three months, you won't want to run out. As a simple, sophisticated listener, get the hair you have always wanted with Vegamore. Go to vegamore.com slash sophisticate and use the code sophisticate to save 20% on your first order. That's vegamore.com, V-E-G-A-M-O-U-R.com slash sophisticate using the promo code sophisticate to save 20% at vegamore.com slash sophisticate. The Simple Sophisticate is also sponsored by Masterclass. With Masterclass, you can learn from the world's best minds anytime, anywhere, and at your own pace. You can learn how to songwrite with John Legend, improve your relational intelligence with Esther Pearl, explore impactful giving with Melinda French Gates, or learn the importance and the how-to of pleasure pursuits with Steve Martin, Billy Collins, Penn & Teller, and more. 
Having signed up for Masterclass, I have taken a couple of different classes over the last couple of years. My first one was with Malcolm Gladwell as he teaches how to write engaging nonfiction. And as someone who writes nonfiction, I wanted to learn from someone who has clearly figured out this craft and dive into his expertise. I've also taken Alice Waters' course, The Art of Home Cooking. You learn how to create a well-stocked pantry. She shares all of her staples and recipes throughout from a market fresh dinner to that famous Alice's egg in a spoon cooking demonstration. The beauty of becoming a member of Masterclass is that it's not necessary to sit down and consume a full lesson from start to finish in a certain period of time. Each lesson is about 10 minutes, which is great. And so you can fit it in when it best suits your schedule. I would sometimes listen to Malcolm Gladwell while I was walking. And Alice Waters, I would listen to her while I was walking too, but then I would be that much more inspired to get back in my kitchen. As a simple, sophisticated listener, I highly recommend you check it out. Get unlimited access to every class. And as a listener of the Simple Sophisticate podcast, you will get 15% off an annual membership. Go to masterclass.com slash simple now. That's masterclass.com slash simple for 15% off masterclass. Welcome back. Number nine on our list of the 15 first key elements that I included in my English Cottage Inspired Home, we have six more items to get to. Number nine is curtains. Tall, complimentary curtains for rooms of cozying in. What I mean by that, well, let me explain. There are a variety of different curtains to explore adding to your cottage. Not all of them will be the tall floor-to-ceiling curtains. Absolutely not. And And I look forward to talking about different ones in future episodes and postings. But today... I would like to talk or share with you where to add tall drapery to your cottage. Basically anywhere where where you want to relax and unwind. So for example, tall curtains, um, some ceiling to floor or at least as tall as you and likely taller and then draping to the ground. Soften the space, enabling you to change the amount of light that streams through and they just finish a room gently. What rooms am I talking about here? Bedrooms? reading nooks, some bathrooms near a soaking tub perhaps, and then some dining rooms. Now keep in mind all that was shared about the fabrics and mixing and matching prints and previous points today because the same rules apply when it comes to finding what is the best fabric for your curtains. I will provide a couple of links on this particular point because you can tour. I just finished two projects in my house with curtains such as these. Um, You can tour the curtains in my dining room and, um, and in my reading nook. And you can learn about the wool semi-sheer curtains that I have in my primary bedroom. And you can also discover why I chose the linen curtains that hang in my primary bathroom. So I have quite a few um, drapery curtains in my house. And for me, it softens um, this palette and this space. Now, I'm not putting those tall curtains in my office, um, nor am I going to put them um, in my kitchen or in my bedroom boot and basket room. So those will be either Roman shades or blinds, wooden blinds, things like that. So that's number nine. Um, which rooms do you want to put the tall complimentary per- curtains in? It would be the, cur- the it would be the rooms you want to cozy in. Um, in. Number 10, table lamps, invest and have fun. As I shared in number four on our list today, once you have removed or no longer use the overhead lighting, you do still need light coming from somewhere if you don't have enough natural light. And this is where table lamps and I should say floor lamps come in. Of course, pendant, chandelier, and semi-flush work well also, primarily in the kitchen, the foyer or the entry, the mudroom, hallways, offices. But additionally, to all of these rooms, and especially the living rooms and bedrooms, add light that is at slightly above eye level when you are sitting, then add a shade that works in that space aesthetically. Don't feel you have to use the shade that the lamp comes with if that is the case. Now, one rule of thumb that Rita Koenig teaches is wherever someone can sit down, so an armchair, a sofa, any chair that you have, except for the dining room table, but really this fits as well, it's just on a different, bigger scale, make sure you have a place for your drink 
and light to read by. Again, add dimmers if that is an option with your lamps, but this design detail has been a conscious choice upon moving into Le Papillon, and I have now added three or four new lamps um, to the previous other lamps I have had for many years, and some I have since changed the lampshade to work in their new space. It just softens everything. And you don't have to have them all on at once, and depending on where you are in the space. I mean, when I had a dinner party, I was very thoughtful, and I still learned from what worked and what didn't, but I tried to you know, set the tone of the room based on which, uh, what we're having. So we would move after the dinner occurred, we went to the living room and I shifted the lights on or off based on where we were just to kind of guide people to a different spot in the house, especially this house that's open plan. So that's number 10 table lamps, invest and have fun. You can buy very traditional lamps or you could have whimsical lamps, have some fun with this. Number 11, a fireplace, wood or gas, adorned with thoughtful, classic, signature attention. If you are fortunate to have a fireplace in your cottage, whether it is a traditional wood burning or a gas fireplace, even if you don't use it very often or at all, decorate around it thoughtfully and keep all of the ideas shared above and below in our list in mind. I recently redid my mantle around my gas fireplace because it was modern in its aesthetic with the tile and the finish. And so what I did, I mean, I changed everything. I changed out the tile and I used a classic uh, cottage choice, the Delft tile, the white tile that you see with the blue um, design, sometimes floral, sometimes people. I went with that. And then I added a wooden frame, painted it white, and even added two sconces. Because again, following Koenig's advice um, with regards to having a light and a place to put your drink, I had a place to put the drink, but there was no room to put any table in my... Um, by my fireplace, just really narrow. So there was no place to put an actual table for a lamp. And so I said, okay, I need to put sconces in. And we were right in the middle of remodeling the guest bathroom and it provided direct access behind the wall to the fireplace. And so I said, let's do it. Let's put sconces in. That was a complete on the spot decision, but it was one that after having taken that course, I knew I needed light over there because I lived through that, um, reading my books in that area in the winter time and there was just no light over there. You couldn't read over there very well. So on top of the mantle, that's also some place you can have a lot of fun. Be thoughtful, but do try not to clutter, but don't let it be too sparsely adorned either. Um, change it up when you're inspired to do so, which leads me to number 12. And just to, to recap, number 11 is a cottage typically needs a fireplace, wood or gas, adorned with thoughtful, classic signature attention. But uh, moving on to number 12, strike a balance of intentional bountiful, yet not excess. And what I, I use the phrase bountiful from the quote that began our conversation today, it can, it can look, it's definitely not going to be a minimalist look, but it's all intentional uh, when you look closely. So sometimes cottages without an understanding of how to create cozy without clutter can become overwhelming in too much upholstery or, or too many, and I put this in air quotes, cute details. And this to me is claustrophobic. I don't, I've been in those houses where they just have collections upon a collections and they have the low ceilings and I just feel enclosed and claustrophobic. And I didn't want that. I don't want that. That doesn't to me feel comforting. It feels confining. And that was created by not just the ceiling being low, but also just there was no space to breathe in there or relax. So you do want to be bountiful by the way of vo avoiding being minimalistic. And as so long as each item fits those two requirements, beautiful and functional, you will not have excess. So try to find that balance. And you'll know because it's how you feel in that space. Um, and just look at the pieces you have. And I'm sitting in my office right now and I look around and I'm seeing, okay, each chair has a purpose. Each table has a function and I like the look of them. The space is not done, by the way. I'm not done with my office. I'm still working on it. But that is the, that is the directive I carry with me when I make decisions about furniture and, and detail. So that's number 12, strike that balance. Number 13, Invest in a quality goose or feather down sofa. Again, this is for our cottage. I mentioned above in an earlier point that I have a George Sherlock sofa. So this is, a, again, a brand that was recommended by Rita Koenig. Um, she shared three different brands um, that she recommends. And uh, this is made in England. 
And um, this was a big investment item. But I had been living with a consignment sofa for quite a while here in Bend. Um, I didn't pay that much for it, but I liked the look of it. So I liked the look of it, but it was not comfortable. And I lived with that for quite a while because you just don't go out and buy it. Even if it is consignment, it just, it's just a big decision. But it wasn't terribly expensive compared to the George Sherlock. And I just, I didn't know what I was going to get next because I wanted to wait till I owned my own home here in Bend. So I waited and I just used that old sofa until I knew for sure what I wanted and I was going to invest. And then prior to that sofa, I had a sofa that I could afford at that point in my career as a teacher that I had with me for 15 years. And I really got a lot of good use out of it. So I told myself, because I didn't want a big house, I still wanted a house, obviously, that's very comfortable. And part of a comfortable living space is having a comfortable sofa, but I wanted it to look good. Again, fitting those two pieces or those questions we ask ourselves when welcoming pieces into our house. And so this was a lifetime purchase. And um, it has to be aesthetically appealing um, in the cottage aesthetic um, that I love. So I invested and customized with fabric that works in my space. And so what does that mean exactly? So plush feelings of down and feather, a combination based on the firmness that I wanted. And I was working with someone who knew about this distinction of percentages. So I was asking her advice. Um, I may way down the road, a reupholster, but it will be way down the road and likely something similar because I love this fabric. So it's just a matter of how long it lasts. But I know that the structure of this ha- of this sofa, and it has those rolled English arms, um, the legs, the wooden legs, and the um, the two big pudding-like uh, sofa sofa cushions. I know it, this will be with me for a lifetime. And it took oh, let's see, I think a year for me to find this brand, and then it took me six or seven months to finally have it arrive at my house um, because I needed the sturdiness. And I needed the comfort. So I needed the space, the depth, and I needed a length to fit who I am, being really tall. And um, as someone who hosts dinner parties, I don't have a lot of space in my house. So I needed a sofa that could seat quite a few people comfortably. So they wanted to stay. My consignment sofa was not a place people wanted to sit and stay. (laughs) So again, these are the things. What is it that you love? What is it that makes you feel at home? And then choose to invest. You won't regret those kind of decisions if you really know yourself and you know what makes you feel at home. So that's number 13. Invest in a quality goose or feather down sofa. 14 is upholstered chairs of all types. The upholstered detail is a must, but not everything needs to be upholstered in a cottage. This is where that balance that we spoke about earlier must be struck. You will want some wood and hard structures, whether in the entire make of the piece of furniture or in the feet or the arms of the chair, table, or sofa. Balancing soft and hard surfaces appropriate to each space calms the eye and also communicates what the use of that space is. So Again, using the information we shared earlier in our conversation about the fabric you want to upholster, you will have solid a fabric used on some of your items. Absolutely. Just, again, strike the balance. What's the function? What's it going to be sitting in the room with? What's it have to work with? Um, is it going to be a star? Is it going to be a supporting cast member? Things like that. And this is the fun part. Be patient. Take your time. Really explore different fabric options. There are lovely fabric companies. I should probably write a post about that. There are wonderful fabric companies um, to shop in England. And again, that ship around the world. And they just know how to do fabric very, very well. But of course, there are some wonderful places here in the States as well and around the world. And last but not least, 15. Design a cottage. This was one of my key elements when I moved in that considers what makes your dogs and or cats feel at home. A cottage without a pup or a kitty is like living life without smiling. Our pets are just part of what makes our cottages feel like our sanctuary. And of course, there will be times in our lives when we do not have pets because we know how much they take of our heart and it takes time to grieve and know when or if we will welcome a four-legged companion back into our lives. But either way, Knowing that we have a home that our pets will feel as though they are welcomed 
as well as us and our guests is part of the key essentials to decorating and customizing a cottage. And you all know that I'm a dog lover. I love cats too. I just grew up with cats out in the country. Um, but I, we have neighborhood cats around here. And as long as they leave my birds alone, we have all sorts of conversations with my neighbor cats and I. And I love them. And they hang out my rockery and they say hi to Norman. And, um, you know, just that companionship that those, those, those uh, sweet pups and kittens can bring to our lives. So the first customization that I made to Le Pepillon, the very, very first, and I share in my new book, The Road to Le Pepillon, what this was in more detail, but it was for my pups. And it was a dog door installed into an existing solid door that was in the house before I could even move in. I mean, I, I had signed the papers, but I wasn't moving in for a week because I was um, waiting for the people that were going to help me move in. Um, the date for the movers wasn't until a week later. So before I even moved in, that was the first thing I had done. And over the first year of my living in my home, I also added a screen door to my garden porch and um, as it leads into a small fenced yard, and I put a dog door in that screen door. And there are so many other ideas to consider when making the human home be a pup or cat's home as well, from having cozy beds for each pet placed in a spot in the home that is with people while we go about our daily routines creating their dining area to be inviting, attractive to the eye, and also in a safe spot so that they can eat in peace and visit the water bowl at their leisure and not feel rushed. In my house, their water and food dishes are in my boot and basket room or my mud room, and it's right by the kitchen, so they're close by me, but they're not underfoot, so they're not in the middle of traffic, but they can see everything. Um, it's easily available for them to find. Um, and I've, I just recently actually was so tickled, I found a water bowl, a ceramic water bowl on Etsy um, that was vintage that has green, um, and not solid green, it's like a ombre kind of green, with four different spaniels on around the bowl. And I was like, oh, I want it. Uh, and so I, I reached out and we negotiated on the price a little bit. And it wasn't that expensive. I was so tickled. And it's just perfect height for, for my, my pups. And um, it's not too tall. And then I found actually some dog dishes um, from a classic English uh, cooking store that, uh, that I have mixing bowls up from. And they have dog dishes and they're about five inches in diameter and they're just perfect. So it adds a bit of character and it also looks uh, appropriate in that room, but it's most importantly, highly functional um, for my pups. And something that is vitally important to their mental health, just as it is for humans, is to have ample natural light streaming into the cottage as much as possible. Open the blinds, open the drapes, let the light in and make sure that they, and again, this is primarily for the cooler, cooler and colder months because you'll want to be outside with them, obviously. Um, but this is so important. A priority when I purchased my now home was knowing that my pups had direct access to the fenced lawn. Now I had lived in a, my, a previous home I owned where we had a nice yard, but we actually had to go outside without any fenced area and then I had to lead them to the yard where there was a gate and we would get in and it was absolutely doable and we did that for nine years it was no problem but it was a hassle in the sense that I couldn't just let them go on their own that's why a dog door wouldn't have helped there I always thought that putting a dog door somewhere in a wall that led out to my fenced yard would be a great idea if I'd stayed there longer because it just would have made it nicer for them so at my current house um, my goal was to find a place that I had a connecting house to garden or yard that was fenced and um, they could always come and go through the dog door and I was fortunate to find this house as well having a garden for them to tootle about in with me is as much for my mental health as it is for them as we spend so many hours out there between February into early November if the weather permits we sit outside sometimes on the porches but also on the grass in the shade or out in the sunshine we'll be cutting flowers we were doing that this morning for bouquets or picking berries together the strawberry pots are the pup's favorite as are they mine and I just generally feel as though we have our own entertainment center so to speak 
because we have our own garden, no matter how small it is. And ours is not that big. And I keep my gardening organic because I know they poke around and I want to know that they can do that safely. And I always know which plants are poisonous should they want to chew on plants, which typically is only when they are puppies. Um, so foxgloves and then daffodils. And, and as far as what's in my garden, I know there are others, many others. But that's the other thing too, just being a conscientious gardener when it comes to how you care for and you take, how you take care of your lawn. So making that organic as well, because they are so close to that grass. Needless to say, a home for me is not a home. And in my case, my cottage is not a home without my pups. And it is a true joy and delight to know they feel just as comfortable, safe, and welcomed. Especially, this is what I love, when we arrive home from a long trip and I observe how they move about almost in a sense of relief to be back in their space, the home, our home, because they are a big part of my life and joy. I I love knowing that they feel truly comfortable, safe here. And you can see it in their faces. You can see how they relax and whatnot. And that is just vital. So those are the 15 key essentials that I focused on when I moved into my house now over three years ago. Um, and of course this is an ongoing process and that's a fun process. And I have the bones of the house now the way I want them through the customization and the work with my contractor over the past two years. And now everything else is really for me to do as I want or can and, and what I am inspired to do. And, and it, it, it takes time to know how to live in a house, but this is my approach. It's it's the English cottage aesthetic and the elements of cozy in it and and just really homing and homing in and on what those those uh, what creates that those feelings for me. And I just want to underscore this point: decorating the interior of our homes, in this case our cottage, is a process that takes time. And if the goal is to create a cottage where we feel most at home, that means we must be patient. Perhaps we don't have a house that is technically a cottage, but hope to one day. And as I share in a post, I'll link on the show notes. You can always begin purchasing items that will be perfect for a cottage you will live in someday. You can do that now. I was doing that, as I said, in my early 20s. There's a couple pieces I had when I was in late high school, um, getting ready for college that I still have with me. Uh, Very few, but I I have some and they are with me for a reason. But I'll link to that post. There are 10 key items that purchase away no matter where you are in your life journey. And you can just keep carrying these items with you. So many of my current pieces I use and love were purchased years ago. The tulip chair, for example, that I reupholstered um, for my primary bedroom. I purchased that more than 20 years ago. And it's in great condition. I just had to change the, the fabric. And it is this time that we add to our items that we bring into the space, to the decisions we make, that creates the cozy. Because the pieces are more than just things. They, they hold memories and remind us of either people or times in our lives that were pivotal, powerful, and deeply personal to our life story. Such a feeling cannot be purchased on demand to create a cottage that is our sanctuary. As I sit and type this episode, My two pups are snuggled up in the living room with me. Yes, after one year since the passing of my sweet boy Oscar, and with much thought, examination, and especially consideration for what would be best for Mr. Norman, we welcomed a little girl into our lives this last week. This is not to replace Oscar, for she is beginning her own life story and journey, just as Oscar had his and he will always be held dearly in our hearts. I will be gradually sharing more about her in the coming weeks and months, but if you are a top-tier member, look for a proper introduction in next month's A Cup of Moments. As I'm taping this, she is zonked out on my lap. (laughs) I've had to stop the taping a couple times today um, to see where she was going and to just play with her out in the sunshine. And Norman, Norman is gradually getting used to her. And um, as I'm taping this, she's in my lap, yes, but he is directly below me um, in his brand new bed because I wanted to make sure he knew that he is right here in my heart. And um, you can see a picture of him in his new bed. He loves it. Um, Long overdue. And I'm sorry, buddy, it took this long. 
Uh, we make sure to have our own time together and still go on our walks together as we wait for her to get her all of her shots, which gives Norman breathing room. And he seems to really enjoy those walks. So to, to kind of conclude this episode, don't, don't worry, I have not forgot about the petit plaisir. We'll get to that in a second. Let me describe this current moment where I find myself in my cottage as I wrote this on a sunny fall afternoon. My gentleman boy Norman is in his favorite chair that was handed down to me from my parents and to them from a friend. And my sweet little girl is nestled next to me on the English sofa I spoke about above that is draped with blankets that I have had from many different chapters in my life and the pillows created after working with my dear friend Veronique and fabric from a small business based in England whose fabric when I saw it I said I will find a place for it as it brings a smile to my face when I look at it. This is home. This is comfort and cozy and calm and it and it took years to reach this point but it feels as a cottage should personal to the people who call it home as though it is made for them to just be nap read rest and enjoy the everyday today's list was hard to keep to just 15 items um, but as i'm recording this i'm well into an hour of taping so it's it's i had to cut i had to reduce it to 15 because there are so many more ways that we can focus on interior decor for a cottage along with the exterior and the garden. And I look forward to sharing those and uh, what I discover along the way with you so that you too can create a cottage you love living your life and savoring your everydays. I really appreciate you stopping by and tuning into this episode. And, and you can find all the links we discussed on the show notes at the simplyluxuriouslife.com slash podcast 341. I have also included many different um Posts from the archives, one about remodeling tips, um, about what I learned during my customization process. I also share a list of 34 ideas for adding cozy to your everyday. And I also share 10 brands for cozy cottage British decor. And these are all ones I have shopped and recommend. But now we have a petit plaisir to get to. And I'll meet you in my kitchen. All right, for this week's uh, Petit Plaisir, we are going into the kitchen and you can hear me in my kitchen here at my home in Bend. Um, I just thought it'd be a fun way to share with you um, a recipe. What we're making is something so simple. Um, it actually came from a cookbook I picked up at a used bookstore and it's called In the Kitchen with a Good Appetite. 150 recipes and stories about the food you love by Melissa Clark. And she recently came out with a cookbook inspired by her um, love of the French culture. And this one, ah, I just love going through it because there's all sorts of comfort foods in this, but a lot of them are very simple to make. And we're going to be making a crispy chicken schnitzel with lemony spring herb salad. Now I've kind of adapted the recipe to work for me. So I'll share with you what my my approach is, but um, I'll also kind of share what she has done as well. So the first thing you want to do is I have I grabbed a cast iron skillet off the the rack, and I've just put it on medium heat. And so while that's heating up to temperature, I'm going to prepare the chicken. And what you want to do with the chicken is I just have chin, uh, chicken tenders, um, and you want fairly thin ones. So if you do have a chicken breast, just slice it in half. Um, and so they're little thinner uh, slabs of chicken meat. So I have pulled out some wax paper. And we are going to tenderize the chicken. And I just need a couple of ch chicken tenders because it's for me. And this is actually my lunch time. And joining me in the kitchen is Mr. Norman. Hello, Mr. Norman. He's laying down here on the ground. And we're just going to... Just like that, tenderize. Again, use wax paper and use the soft or flat side of the meat mallet. And then, of course, we're going to uh, season. The easiest thing to do in the world to add a wonderful flavor. And I have a little bit of fleur de sel. And I'm just going to season one side, and then I'll season the second side when they go in or on the stovetop. <laughs> Those are ready to go. Perfect. 
We also want to make the vinaigrette. So I'm going to my cupboard and grabbing a small little mixing bowl. And um, as I mentioned, this is a lemon vinaigrette. So as it says in the title, we need a fresh, one fresh lemon. And you also want one garlic clove, a small garlic clove. So I have a garlic clove out here and I'm gonna prep it. Well, maybe I was gonna prep it. <laughs> that was an old clove. There, I have a fresh, a fresh uh, head of garlic here. And I'm gonna pop it with my side of my knife and my, my palm. And that just makes it very easy to take the skin off, already off, boom, boom, boom. Slice it up, clove. If you want anchovies, um, Melissa Clark has us put anchovies in this, so I don't usually have anchovies on hand, something I probably should have more on hand, um, but that is up to what you have in your pissery, but you'll be just fine. It'll taste just as lovely with um, without the anchovies. So I have my garlic clove all chopped up, and I'm going to add a little bit of salt, and I want to actually put this in a mortar and pestle. And I actually want to check and see where my little girl's at. She's out in the garden. She used the dog door. There she is. Well, hello, sweet girl. There you are, bouncy girl. How are you? Just checking out the strawberry pots. Yes, she loves the strawberry pots. In fact, we found her. Not found her. I was at her with her. And she was plopped on top of them. Just climbed right in, didn't you? And started searching for strawberries because we snack on strawberries, as I was mentioning earlier. And she's just going to stay out in the sunshine. Back to cook. Oh, boop, 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 boop. She's back. Hello. We have two heartbeats in the house with mom cooking. So now we're gonna put the garlic with the salt into the mortar and pestle. And we're just going to press it until, if you can hear this. And just smush it down. And if it's not perfect taste, that's okay. You want to combine, now add that to your mixing bowl. Voila, voila. Mmm, yum. It just looks good. The granules of salt, you can feel that in there. Beautiful. It's not L labor. Good girl. Now you're going to take a, a fresh lemon. So I was, I'll pick that in the market of the store. And we're going to grade the zest of one lemon into the same bowl with the garlic. Again, the vinaigrette really is what takes the longest for this recipe, and it's not going to take more than a couple minutes once you have it memorized. Good. Look at all that lovely zest. Never forget the zest. That's what's going to add such a deep lemony flavor. It's so simple to do. I always have lemons on hand in the kitchen. Okay. Oof, starts to the kitchen beautifully. And you want two, about two tablespoons of fresh lemon juice. And I just hold my hand and squeeze into my palm, and that catches the seeds. Perfect. That's about a tablespoon there. I have about a medium-sized lemon. Ooh, that one gave a lot of juice. So I have more than two tablespoons. So about two and a half tablespoons. And I'm going to need about three times as much olive oil as I have lemon juice. Some people do one to three. Others do one to four. It's really to taste. But before you do that, add a little pinch of salt and a little turn of pepper. Now with a small whisk, mix the, those ingredients up before you add the olive oil. So you have your garlic and the salt, that was the case now, the zest, the lemon juice, and salt and pepper. Now you're gonna add and whisk at the same time about seven to eight tablespoons of olive oil. Beautiful. And again, to taste. So just keep tasting as you go, and you will know what works for you. And this is really for about three to four people. So if you're doing it for yourself, you can do a lot less. Half that lemon would have been just perfect. So I have now lemon uh, vinaigrette for tomorrow and the next day. Mm hmm Ooh, that's beautifully lemony. And if you find that it's just too lemony, just add a little bit more olive oil. Okay, so our vinaigrette is ready to go. Now, let us make chicken schnitzel. 
la 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 la. So my cast iron pan is ready. And what you need to do is set up a station of three plates or bowls. First, you're gonna to want to put a little bit of flour because we'll bread the chicken that's been seasoned. Then you want a bowl, a small flat low bowl that has one egg. Um, we'll pull the chicken into that. So let's do that. I have my flour now. I wanna put my egg in my bowl. And if you need to make more chicken schnitzel and you don't wanna use more eggs, just add a little water. And essentially you're just trying to create something that is going to keep the flour in place and let the panko stick to something. And sometimes I find that having a little water makes it easier to do that. Sometimes the egg is too um, viscous and too thick. So I'm just going to do that. I just added a tablespoon of water. Perfect. Now I have panko here instead of breadcrumbs. It's totally your choice. I like panko. It's softer, it's lighter, it's crunchier in my opinion. Um, here we go. Add a little bit of panko to the next plate. So I have three plates or two plates in one bowl. Here we go. The pan. All right, here we go. The pan is hot. It's at a medium heat, no hotter. You do want to put a decent amount of olive oil in the pan. I would put about an eighth of a cup. You can hear it pop in there. Um, because you're going to actually uh, baste the chicken with the oil as it cooks on the first side. So I'm breading the chicken, breading the chicken, dredging it into the egg wash. Now into the panko. The dogs are watching with, well, normally might be sleeping. Missy's over there just watching. Okay, here we go. Let's put this into the pan. Beautiful. Not too hot, just enough. All right, now I'm going to take some of that oil and put it over the top. Oh, it's going to pop and crack a little bit. This is lovely. Here we go. I want the top to start cooking at the same time that the bottom is cooking. And this is something, um, this basting um, approach is something I talked about in episode two of this season's Season five, the Simply Luxurious Kitchen Cooking Show, when we were uh, cooking cod and halibut, is that basting while the first side is cooking actually brings a flavor throughout the fish, or in this case, the chicken, and it starts the cooking process on the top um, before it, it's flipped over so that it cooks in less time, but it cooks more evenly. So for dressing the salad, if it's just you and you have a ton of lemon vinaigrette, which I do right now, I go get a dish, a small bowl or a dish, and just drizzle in about one to two tablespoons of the dressing. And then, I take my lettuce. Then I take my mis mixed greens. And here I have some spinach, baby spinach, and some arugula. And I actually have some broccoli sprouts or you could also call them micro broccoli. <laughs> and I just toss this. So the, the salad is all ready to go. And the chicken was gonna be placed on top of it or next to it, warm and ready. And that is all there is to it. So now the chicken is being flipped. Oh, nice and golden brown. Ooh, beautiful, beautiful. Still based on the side that just was flipped over, even though it's cooked, just to keep it moist. Hey guys, hey pups. She just went up to Norman and said, hello, can I get close to you? And he just looked at her and said, you know, I just had a drink of water, let's think about this. She's being very respectful and Norman's being very kind. Yes, you are, good dogs. They're like, something smells good. Yes, it does. Again, this uh, videotaping or audio recording is really pretty much um, real time. So as you're seeing, this is taking no more than 10 minutes. Chicken is almost done. I cooked it about three to four minutes on one side. Depends on how thick the chicken tenders are. So do tenderize. It makes them so 
well, tender when you cut into them. It's not sinewy or hard or cut into, and it also increases the cook time in the stovetop. Right on? Right, Nohanen? Good dog, good dog. All right, the chicken is done. I'm gonna put them both on the plate. Beautiful. I'm gonna add the salad. Yeah, we're almost ready to have lunch, aren't we? And that's it. Let's take a bite of this. Let's see what we got, little one. You'll get a nibble, I promise, Norm. Oh, you can hear the crackle even in the taking that cut through. Here we go. Mm. The lemon in that salad. It's just so light and refreshing, but it's also very satiating. And the chicken has the fat, but it's still lean. And the crunch, but also the tender inside. So a very simple recipe, one that's full of flavor and only asks for you to use everyday ingredients you would have in your pantry or your refrigerator. So go ahead and give a try this crisp chicken schnitzel with lemony spring herb salad from Melissa Clark's book, In the Kitchen with a Good Appetite. Thank you for joining me in my kitchen for this episode's Petit Plaisir. You can watch full video of so many other episodes from the Simply Luxurious Kitchen cooking show. We're in the middle of season five right now and every Saturday, it began the second Saturday of September and runs through the end of October. I have a new cooking episode for you. And this coming Saturday, we're going to make an herb souffle. Yes, you can do it. So simple, so good. We'll even pop the champagne for this one. I do hope you'll tune in. That's on the blog, The Simply Luxurious Life, the cooking show every Saturday during September and October. I hope you've enjoyed this week's Petit Plaisir, where each week ideas are shared to make the everyday all the more enjoyable. Tune in at the end of each episode where I'll recommend a book, a film, a show, a recipe, anything that is a simple pleasure to satiate your sophisticated taste. Before we wrap up today, I want to send a big thank you to a new listener of the podcast. Jimmy Blake wrote, Simply the Best Holistic Self-Improvement Podcast, giving five stars, only found this podcast mid-2022 and have since gone back to the start, and I am listening to every episode in the back catalog. In every episode, Shannon shares her learning and journey in self-improvement to help you achieve becoming the best possible you. Topics span mind, body, and soul with a fair amount of timeless style, good housekeeping, and delicious food thrown in for good measure. Topics are well-researched, and the show notes are impeccable. Anglophiles and Francophiles will appreciate Shannon's love of our culture. As a typically self-deprecating Brit, it's always good to see a positive external view of ourselves and our country. Also, I agree. James Smith and Sons and Bloomsbury do make the best umbrellas in the world. I have two. Her style is very conversational. It's like having a well-educated good friend around for a cup of tea and a chat. But one where you're left with always at least one petit plaisir to take away and try from each visit. Thank you so very much, Jimmy Blake, for sharing your review. I am deeply chuffed and very grateful. I do hope you continue to enjoy all of the archived episodes of this show. And when you do tune into this episode, I do hope you step in your kitchen and give the chicken schnitzel a try. <laughs> all right, everyone. I'll be back in two weeks time on the 19th of October with a brand new episode. I hope you have a wonderful start to this new month. And until next time, I'll see you on the block. Bonjour. Thank you for tuning in to the Simple Sophisticate podcast, where intelligent living is paired with signature style. For more ideas and inspiration throughout the week, visit the blog, The Simply Luxurious Life, with the shortened URL, tsll.co or the simply luxurious life.com for more in-depth exploration of how to cultivate your own unique simply luxurious life pick up my new book which became both a bestseller and number one new release in france travel the road to le papillon daily meditations on true contentment available in all four formats for your preferred reading or listening 
my first book titled Choosing the Simply Luxurious Life and my second book Living the Simply Luxurious Life are also available in each of the four formats. Readers can now join the more intimate the Simply Luxurious Life international community by becoming members of the blog, which offers the benefits of ad-free reading site-wide, unlimited access and exclusive access to content on the blog, such as the monthly A Couple Moments with Shannon video chat, tours of my home Le Papillon, the monthly What Made Me Smile post, and monthly Ponderings post, as well as the exclusive opportunity to enter all of the giveaways during the annual French and British Weeks. To stay caught up on all things Simply Luxurious, the podcast, blog posts, the cooking show, and receive exclusive news, as well as an extra dose of inspiration to jumpstart each new month, subscribe to the Simply Luxurious Live's free monthly newsletter, arriving on the last day of each month in your inbox. There is also a weekly newsletter, which is also free, and arrives each Friday to keep you caught up on the recent weekly posts on the blog. Enjoy with a hot cuppa or cup of morning coffee, and stay in the know about all things Simply Luxurious. Look for two new episodes of this podcast on the first and third Wednesday of each month. And until next time, I'm your host, Shannon Abels. Thank you for tuning in. Bonjour.